Okay, we're going to talk about acetylcholine and answer the questions, what is acetylcholine and what occurs during acetylcholine synthesis, storage, release, receptor binding, and degradation? And what are some clinical correlations associated with acetylcholine? Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Morton, and I'm the noted anatomist. First question, what is acetylcholine? Well, it's a neurotransmitter derived from acetyl-CoA and choline. So there's the chemical structure, there's the acetyl group, there's the choline group, and shing, they make a wonder twin power of acetylcholine. And there's the ACH abbreviation. Now, many neurons release acetylcholine. For example, all parasympathetic neurons, both preganglionic and postganglionic parasympathetic neurons, release acetylcholine. Sympathetic neurons do, but only the preganglionic, not the postganglionic, with the exception of sweat glands. And then all somatic motor neurons release acetylcholine into the neuromuscular junction. Anywhere there's a skeletal muscle, there's a neuron that releases acetylcholine to cause it to contract. And then a variety of central nervous system neurons found in the basal forebrain, the diencephalon, the hippocampus, and so forth. Basically, all peripheral nervous system motor neurons release acetylcholine except postganglionic sympathetic neurons, but even there is one exception. The central nervous system neurons in these video tutorials are not ones that I'm going to focus on so much. The following steps comprise the process of acetylcholine transmission, and I'm going to talk about steps A through E using the following schematic. So let's start with first the synthesis of acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is synthesized from acetyl coenzyme A and choline through an enzyme called choline acetyltransferase. So here's a terminal axon and there's a mitochondria that gives rise through biochemical process to acetyl CoA. In the terminal axon membrane, there is these um, high affinity choline transporters that take choline from the extracellular space and transport them into the cytoplasm of the neuron. This is a rate limiting step of acetylcholine synthesis. Now, to put those two together, we have an enzyme called choline acetyltransferase that is, has its highest concentrations in the nerve terminal, and it's a marker that a neuron is cholinergic if you find this enzyme. So choline acetyltransferase takes uh, acetyl-CoA and choline and shing, puts them together to make acetylcholine. Choline acetyltransferase is like Cupid or Emma. And then the acetylcholine transferase, uh, the choline acetyltransferase takes that acetylcholine and dumps it into the cytoplasm. And so acetylco acetylcholine I'm going to show as an orange circle or as that circle with a square on it in both ways in this tutorial. There is the synthesis of acetylcholine. Next, we're going to talk about a clinical correlate uh, with a drug called hemicholinium, which uh, blocks the choline transporter. If you block the choline transporter, then choline cannot enter the neuron. If that happens, then choline acetyltransferase cannot synthesize the acetylcholine, and therefore there's no ACH to store and release. All right, let's now talk about the storage of acetylcholine. ACH is transported from the cytoplasm into a vesicle by a carrier protein called vesicular acetylcholine transporter. So here's the terminal axon, and all these acetylcholine molecules are wanting to get into these vesicles. And so we have this vesicular acetylcholine transporter, shing, that takes acetylcholine from the cytoplasm and transports them or enables them to be transported into these individual vesicles, like that. So basically, VACHT loads the gumball machine. If the gumballs are acetylcholine, it puts them all together into a closed space. Um, there's about 1,000 to 50,000 acetylcholine molecules per vesicle. So it doesn't look so much like this picture as it does that picture. But then there's also 300,000 vesicles per cholinergic neuron. So it doesn't look so much like that as it looks like that. And so here in this uh, EM, the letter T represents an axon terminal, terminal, the letter M a skeletal muscle, and those circles in the axon terminal are individual vesicles containing thousands of acetylcholine molecules. 
Um, now, acetylcholine-bound vesicles are protected by acetylcholine esterase, which is an enzyme that cleaves acetylcholine into its acetate and choline counterparts. But if you have acetylcholine inside the vesicles, acetylcholine esterase cannot degrade them. So there is the storage of acetylcholine. Now, a clinical correlate, there's a drug called vesemicol that blocks the vesicular acetylcholine transporter. When that occurs, it inhibits acetylcholine from being stored in a vesicle. And these empty vesicles that have no ACH, then when the neuron goes to secrete them, that vesicle fuses with the membrane and there's little to no release of acetylcholine. Let's now talk about the release of acetylcholine. An action potential causes an influx of calcium and promotes vesicle fusion with the membrane and then ACH is released into the synaptic cleft. So here's a terminal axon and an action potential spreads over the terminal axon and then it causes this voltage gated calcium channels to open and calcium influxes from a high to a low concentration into the cytoplasm and then the calcium interacts with the vesicles causing them to fuse with the presynaptic membrane with the by via these snare proteins and snare proteins mediate the fusion of the vesicles with the presynaptic membrane for release of acetylcholine into the synapse um, in other words you put nickels into the gumball machine to get gumballs out and so similarly, you put calcium into this uh, terminal axon to get acetylcholine out. Unless you have a condition called Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome, which is a rare autoimmune disorder where antibodies block and destroy voltage-gated calcium channels. When this occurs, calcium cannot enter into the cell and therefore calcium-dependent triggering synaptic vesicle does not occur. And then... As a result, the acetylcholine vesicles do not fuse with the membrane and the neuron does not release acetylcholine. Another clinical correlate is this botulinin toxin, which cleaves the snare protein complex. Um, without the snare proteins, the vesicles cannot fuse with the membrane. And as a result, neurons cannot release these vesicle-bound acetylcholine molecules and the botulinin toxin results in a disease called botulism, which is the most poisonous biological substance known. And it's Latin for botulus, which means sausage, because it was called the sausage disease, because pork sausage particularly is what people realize if you had por bad pork sausage, you get really, really sick and a good chunk of people die. Now this, this physician named uh, Justinus Kerner was ahead of his time. He was the first physician in Germany and really recorded to describe the botul what we now know as botulism. And he predicted that someday the substance causing the disease would have medical applications. So the botulinin toxin in the early 70s was used. They took a dilated uh, version of the botulinin toxin and they treated strabismus. So they would inject it into the lateral rectus. In this case, this patient has the lateral rectus is too tight and it paralyzes some of the strands of the lateral rectus to relax the eye to its natural position. Hyperhidrosis, where people are sweating in the palms of their hands like crazy, you inject the botulinin toxin, it stops those neurons from secreting acetylcholine, they stop sweating. Overactive bladder, and there's always this urgency to urinate, you put three or four of these injections of the botulinum, diluted botulinum toxin into the bladder, and it relaxes the, uh, causes the bladder so it's not contracting. And then cosmetically for wrinkles and also for migraine headaches is what the botulinum toxin is used. It's a beautiful example of human ingenuity. This is why they call it the miracle toxin. So there's the synthesis, storage, and release of acetylcholine. Let's now talk about cholinergic receptors. So acetylcholine interacts with two main classifications of cholinergic receptors, nicotinic and muscarinic. Squirrel! I'm going to take a bit of a tangent here for a second. So there's a tobacco plant that makes a molecule called nicotine, and scientists realize that nicotine binds to receptors inside the body, and they said, hey guys, what do we call this? receptor that binds nicotine. And they said, I know, let's call it nicotinic receptors. Then another group said, hey, there's this mushroom that creates a molecule called muscarin and muscarin binds to receptors inside the body. 
And they said, gentle people, what do we call these receptors that bind muscarinic? They said, I know, we'll call them muscarinic receptors. Hence how we have nicotinic and muscarinic receptors. Something I want you to realize is that both nicotine and muscarin are not made in the body. They're exogenous molecules. But nicotinic and muscarinic receptors are made and found in the body. So the pockets of the nicotinic and muscarinic receptors are specific to nicotine and muscarin respectively. So nicotine cannot bind to muscarinic receptors and muscarin cannot bind into the pocket of a nicotinic receptor. Now enter acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is made and found inside the body. And the structure of, a needle, of acetylcholine enables it to bind within the pockets of both the nicotinic receptors and muscarinic receptors. So cholinergic receptors of nicotinic and muscarinic. So the take home message is this, acetylcholine binds to two types of cholinergic receptors, nicotinic and muscarinic. Okay. Now the structure of acetylcholine is not really the shape of a circle and a square, but I wanted to, I, I drew it this way to show that it can bind to both of the pockets of the nicotinic and muscarinic receptors. And that's the physiological and pharmacological thing I wanted you to recognize with acetylcholine. Now, there are a couple of different types of nicotinic receptors. There's nicotinic receptors found only on skeletal muscle, hence the N, little m for muscle, and also found on postganglionic neuronal cell bodies, hence the little n for neuron. You can also find nicotinic receptors on the adrenal medulla chromaffin cells. These are ligand-gated ion channels. Now, muscarinic receptor types, there's three. There's actually five, but we'll focus on M1 in the CNS, M2, these receptors are primarily found in the heart, and M3, which is found everywhere else in the body where parasympathetic innervation occurs, plus sweat glands. And muscarinic receptors function through a G-protein coupled receptor where they use second messengers. There are all the cholinergic receptors in the body. Let's now talk about the inactivation. After acetylcholine performs its nerve signal transmitter function, it is inactivated by acetylcholine esterase. So here we have um, acetylcholine esterase, which I have symbolized as a pair of scissors. It's bound to the postsynaptic membrane adjacent the cholinergic receptors. It's very efficient. It cleaves acetylcholine molecules at 1,000 per second. And it's the primary way of inactivating acetylcholine. It's the only neurotransmitter that is cleaved. All the other neurotransmitters, after they're released by a neuron, go through a process of reuptake like catecholamines. So there are both the nicotinic and muscarinic cholinergic receptors and recognize they have the acetylcholine esterase enzyme beside it. So when acetylcholine binds, shing, it breaks it off into the acetate and choline substrates or, or uh, molecules. And so that's what acetylcholine esterase does. Even unbound acetylcholine is broken down immediately as well, even before it has a chance to bind to the receptor. So acetylcholine released from the vesicles is more more in concentration and quantity than is what is actually needed for the physiological activity. You have far more acetylcholine molecules than you have cholinergic receptors. Now, a clinical correlate is you have these uh, molecules called acetylcholine esterase inhibitors. They inhibit acetylcholine esterase from breaking down acetylcholine. When this occurs, you have an increase of an accumulation of acetylcholine in the synapse, thus prolonging the action of the stimulation. Examples of acetylcholine esterase inhibitors are organophosphates, um, like fertilizers, sarin gas, uh, horrible, horrible effects on the body. Uh, when you have a high concentration of acetylcholine esterase inhibitors. And that, my friends, is acetylcholine in a nutshell.